Hey guys, this is a story of Capellacy and her three crew that uh, sailed just across the Great Lakes in the Eastern Canyon. I'm Jason, the captain. Boss lady said us we could say something. I'm Ann, boss lady. And I'm Kieran, aka Mr. Jones. And this is our newest crew member, Senior Garfield. Now, let's, let's see what we're, we're up, up, we're up to this week. So guys, this is part two. Uh, we're leaving Matan and uh, making it to PEI uh, in this, <clears throat> excuse me, in this video, in YouTube video. So uh, pay attention because there's a couple of places where you have no choice to stop unless you want to pull 16 or uh, 16 hours of overnighters. Um, this is how we do it. We did it uh, again. Uh, we had a lot of uh, local knowledge that was given to us. Uh, we asked a lot of questions, and I think this is really the best way to tackle this part of the uh, excursion. Again, it's up to you. Uh, well, with no further ado, let's keep on going. Okay, so again, we're starting from Matan. Now, from Matan, you don't really need to start... Uh, worrying about tides and current anymore uh, simple and good reason the St. Lawrence is getting too wide to be affected by a tide now don't get me wrong the tides still really important for going up and down in your clearance when you're at anchor or uh, coming into a marina uh, just like in the Rimouski you don't want to come in at low tide um, or if you come in at low tide you have to watch where you're going now, the tides are indicated very clearly if you have Navionics or CMAPs. Uh, they're easily available, and especially on Navionics, you have uh, high tide, low tide, and you even have, uh, on specific markers, you have the tide going up and going down with the arrow and how many feet it's going to be at what time. And this is really important because if the entrance has... Uh, three feet during low tide, but nine to twelve feet at high tide, uh, you could still come in. It doesn't mean you can only come in at high tide. You could also come in, uh, you know, probably three four hours before high tide and after high tide, uh, which just leaves you a window of about four or five hours that you can't come in. Uh, and this is if you have more than the specified depth. Now, if you look at this uh, chart. In the middle, you won't find any boats at all, uh, or commercial boats at all. And on each side, it indicates you the travel of the commercial vessels. Now, if you stay out of there altogether, you'll never have an issue with commercial vessels. You'll never be in their way. Now, this is Bacomo. And Bacomo is uh, between Rimouski and Bacomo. There's... Uh, sailors can go across and uh, they're both clubs that uh, offer free docking for each other's members now it's a nice little marina uh, you can also uh, put in a sailing uh, log with the Coast Guard and they will check on you uh, to make sure that you arrive at destination um, again, any point after Rimouski, you can do this, and every day you can update your log, and the Coast Guard, uh, if you don't call the Coast Guard uh, on or before the time that you say you would get there by, um, they will literally uh, ail you on the radio, and if after the third time you don't answer, if I'm not mistaken, they come and look for you, uh, which is a really nice thing to do. Uh, from the Canadian Coast Guard. Now, from Bécomo to uh, Rimouski, it's a about 12-hour sailboat ride. It's a nice thing to do. Uh, we didn't exactly have the time to do that, uh, nor did we want to waste any more time around here because we did spend a week in Tadoussac. So what we did... Uh, we started hopping along all the 
major marinas and the ones that people told us to stop at uh, that were really nice and really easy to hook or had room at a dock. Now, we were trying to do this on the cheap, so we wanted to be on the hook as much as possible. Um, now, we stopped here after the Muski, uh, which is uh, Mont Louis. Now, in this little bay, uh, on the left side where the cursor is, there is a fish shop and fisherman wharf right there. Now, on the other side, uh, as you can see, that is a rock wall. Um, now, this rock wall is where Navionics indicates you to go and anchor. Now, we were three boats in there for one night, and the winds came up to about 50 to 50 knots, uh, 50 to 55 knots, uh, right pushing us against the rock wall. Now, not very fun at all, um, and despite having a 60-pound delta anchor with 200 feet of chain out, 3H chain, we still managed to drag. So we ended up going to the fishing dock for that night. Uh, sorry, for the next day. Because the winds were really high and the people, the person that we were with uh, didn't, well, actually to us either, we didn't really feel like keep on going. Now, when we left Mont Louis, we were actually kind of relieved, uh, though they have excellent fish and seafood right there on hand caught that day, uh, we stopped at Riviera Renault. And the reason why, with that big storm, our windlass actually broke. Uh, the electric motor decided to kick the bucket, and uh, we ended up having to get a fix. Now, right here, Riviera Renault, on the Gaspé Peninsula, is probably the town that you want to get stuck at if you have any mechanical issues. Now, as I'm indicating with the mouse right there, this place has anything and everything you'll ever need to fix a boat. They have welders, aluminum welders, stainless steel. If you want electrical motors, electrical issues, um, if you have motor issues, uh, rig, rigging, anything. If you can think of something on a boat, Riviera Renal will have it, and if they don't have it in stock, they can get it the next day. Now, this is really surprising. It's a small town uh, in Quebec, uh, but it is definitely a boating town. It's definitely a fishing town. Now, there's a lot of fishing boats in here, and it shows, uh, you know what, there's a little marina uh, at the end of the port. You can get anything, and the people are super nice. Now, again, when we left there, we came around this peninsula. And you really have to watch those two little dots. And if you keep on getting closer, there's a rock there. And that rock is visible at all times. But at high tide, it's only about a foot above the water. So when you come in, make sure you pay attention to that rock. Um, now, we wanted to stay... There's a little place right where the mouse is. It's about a couple of miles in uh, from the peninsula. And it's on the right-hand side right there. Now, the uh, National Park closed down that little marina. Uh, don't get me wrong, there's still 20,000 boats that go in there, and there's a tour boat that works out of there. Um, if you can manage to get in there, uh, I do think it's free for the night. Uh, we never managed to actually put a toe in there because it's a really, really narrow entrance way. And if you see a bunch of sticks coming out of it, I don't suggest it. So what we ended up doing is we literally anchored just outside of Gaspé's marina. Now, Gaspé Marina is really well located. There's grocery stores, Canadian Tire... Uh, and a few other amenities that are within walking distance. Uh, no, no taxis, no bikes. You can walk it all within 10 minutes. It's an awesome place to be if, uh, again, you need food, um, booze, or anything like that. And the marina is actually really quite nice. The people there are even nicer, and there's a bar right on the water that uh, we quite enjoyed ourselves at. 
Now the gas here is uh, again at the dock. You don't have to worry about tides or anything. Once you're there, if I'm not mistaken, the tide is about three to four feet, which is nothing to call home about. Now we stayed right here beside the bay. Uh, there is a few mooring from the marina that you have to watch out for, um, but you could easily anchor away from these and uh, usually the wind will push you away from shore. Uh, so you have tons of room that, you know, if you don't you unhook, but the ground is muddy and it's a great, great anchoring spot. Now, once we left there, we actually passed between uh, Bonaventure Island and the Rocher Percé. Um, it's quite the view, especially coming in from the backside, because you get to see the hole from both sides. Um, in Bonaventure Island, you could stop there, and uh, you could actually hide behind the dock uh, at anchor and take your dinghy in and walk the island. It's a touristy place. There's a few houses, but nobody lives there. Uh, people used to live on it. Uh, and then as we left that area, we actually came in to uh, St. Therese. And we stayed there just overnight. Now, this is a pure fishing dock. It's not very boat friendly, but the guys there are awesome. They're all fishermen. They understand that we're all stuck on the water together. Um, and from there, uh, it's not a place to stay two, three days, but... Again, if you want to weather out a storm, not too bad. Uh, from there, it only made sense that we didn't go into Baie de Chaleur. So what we did is we actually uh, came right south, like almost 180 degrees. Actually, I think we, did, we were doing a 167 or 170 degrees from there. And we just skimmed the point, the New Brunswick point on the uh, north shore of Baie de Chaleur or the... Uh, south side of uh, the, the Northumberland Strait. Now, it's actually, from here, you can actually pick where you're going. You can do Ile la Madeleine in one shot, or you could do PI in one shot, uh, if you have a crew that uh, can handle it. Uh, it's a it's a perfect triangle. So, you know, we're looking at 20 to 24 hours to go to Ile la Madeleine, and 20 to 24 hours to get to Charlottetown or uh, Shediac, New Brunswick, uh, just out of Moncton. Now, we ended up, because the other person with us was a single uh, single sailor, we ended up doing multiple stops. Now, if you have, if your mast is below 35 feet, you can actually cross here and do the Beta Shalar, but there's a bridge, uh, and the bridge is a... Uh, uh, <coughs> the whole bridge just goes up. I'm trying to remember the name of it, but I can't remember. And the clearance is 35 feet at low tide or something similar to this. So what you have to do is you have to come in on the uh, on the outside and actually come back in. And this is a ship again, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but you could also stay at that marina right here and... Um, and take your dinghy all the way up. Now, on the other side in Bay de Chalar, the marina is quite big, and there's probably over 150 fishing boats. Uh, the services and the amenities are pretty awesome, and there is a, uh, a small craft or personal watercraft uh, marina. Um, but this was about a 10 to 12 hour day when we left St. Therese, and we came in just like that, and we stopped in ship again. The whole shore of New Brunswick is sand, and the sand lasts forever in a day. So once you get close to shore, make sure to follow those buoys. Uh, the person that we were with again, uh, Mr. Regan, uh, he <laughs> uh, he rubbed bottom. I'm gonna say more than his turn, uh, and he was still following the buoys and that and. Uh, I'll, you know, I have to. I have to agree with him. He was within the buoys, but even if you get a little too close to the sides, again, you might just touch bottom. Now, when we came in to Shidiac Bay, um, the 
the weather had changed. We came in under about six foot waves and about 40 knot winds. Now, there's no way I was going to try to get into this marina following those green buoys, especially not in six foot waves, sideways, because the, these waves were coming straight up from straight up. So you have to follow this rock wall and do a 180 degree turn to get into the marina. And not a chance. So what we ended up doing is I actually turned into it. I looked at it. I said, not a fat chance. So we ended up passing right beside the marina and going to hide behind it. Now, you see there's a couple of anchors behind here, and uh, possibly one of them is ours, uh, but to uh, indicate that you could easily come and anchor here. Uh, maybe Shidiak Bay. Who did, there, there you go. There, there's, our, uh, there's our anchor marker. Now, as you go along this uh, trip, if ever you go to PEI and so forth, you'll see a lot of these anchors with the plus came from us because we did lay down a lot of uh, places to go hide. Uh, and we actually stayed there. So when we came and hid behind the uh, marina, there was other boats that came and hid in this bay also. One of them was over here. And he got a, pardon my French, but ship ticket. Um, he was in four, three, four foot waves. And even if it was like a 40, 42 foot boat, they couldn't have had a nice night. Us, on the other hand, behind the, uh, the, the marina and the wall, uh, it lowered to about two feet, two and a half feet uh, during the worst of the storm. Uh, we do have it in a video where you can see the boat banging around uh, on the anchor. Don't get me wrong. 40 knot winds, we never moved an inch. Uh, we were in about 12 foot of water, what, 120 feet out, 130 feet out, with that 60 pound anchor, and it's all muck. So she grabbed and she, we never moved. It's 10 to 1. And uh, yeah, 10 to 1 scope was kind of mandatory that day. Yeah. So when we left Shediac, we actually went and slept underneath the bridge that day. Uh, because again, you could do straight to Charlottetown, uh, but that is quite the long day. And uh, we just didn't feel like it after being shaken and not stirred for <laughs> a couple of days. So what we ended up doing is there's a old uh, mussel farm or something of that nature just past the bridge when you're going in this direction. Uh, it's a, it's an old port, uh, not being used anymore. That's where the ferry used to go, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, there's a few places you can go on the Nova Scotia side. Uh, we just decided to skip and go straight for uh, underneath the bridge. Now, as you can see, the bridge is right there on the screen. And so we left Shidiac Bay. And we did a about six or seven hour ride to just... Uh, in, uh, in front of the city is uh, Dalton or Bolton uh, PEI. Yeah, Bolden. Borden. Yeah, uh, PEI. And exactly here, this is where we stopped. Uh, port Borden. Now, this port is closed except for a couple of fishing vessels that still uh, go on the dock here. Uh, the only part of the dock that's accessible is probably the last. 40 feet and it's already taken uh, for anybody that has like a four foot uh, draft uh, or more. Uh, now again, we stayed at anchor here and it was quite comfortable. Uh, beautiful sunrise. Uh, we left around six o'clock that morning. Um, you can't go on the wall that's on the southeast corner. Um, reason why is the wall is probably around 25 foot high. Mind you, there's still ladders, but uh, don't ask me how you would tie up. I have no clue. So from there, it was an easy day, day ride straight to Charlton. Now, there's three uh, big yacht clubs or marinas in Charlottetown. Uh, all three of them are really nice. They're really tight. Uh, but if you go to the Charlton Yacht Club... Um, I'm going to say it's probably one of the nicest ones there. Uh, we looked at the other two. Uh, they're almost as nice. The facilities are good. 
Uh, but if you have a sailboat, Charlton Yacht Club is definitely the place to be. Um, if you have a powerboat, I'm going to suggest a second one in uh, because that's that's to whom they cater more to. Not saying that they don't do sailboats. I'm just saying that they cater a little bit more to the powerboat scene or crowd. Uh, now, again, Charlton Yacht Club, uh, I think they were saying they're the, one of the oldest clubs in North America uh, uh, for... Uh, sailboats and such and they have a great team they have uh, great lessons and such uh, if you want to spend your day there or even a few days it's a great little town to visit uh, now we actually came out of there because the next day the winds were not favorable for us to finish our journey so we actually ended up going and anchoring now that was probably our worst mistake <laughs> that we've done this whole trip uh, because the wind coming in from one direction and the waves coming in from another uh, did not make for a nice sleep at all. Um, yes. And, uh, yes, it was... <laughs> we should have stayed around Charlottetown that day and motored out. But uh, we ended up staying here and we actually sailed out. Uh, though the night was... We all agreed at somewhere around 6 o'clock in the morning that the night was done because of the waves, and we just decided to pick up the hook and leave. Uh, which, you know, it does happen. Uh, <laughs> so from this bay to where we stopped close to Panmure Island, which is uh, about two, three hours south of Surrey uh, Harbor, um, we actually went, came in and anchored just behind Panmure Island right here, where you can go to Georgetown in the upper left corner, but we anchored right here in this little bay. And you want to talk about protected. You want to talk about nice bottom. Uh, you can throw an anchor in here. And if you move, well, I'm going to say, unfortunately, you better quit anchoring. Uh, it's muck. And you drop your anchor and your anchor actually sinks in. And the longer you stay there, the less likely you'll be able to bring your anchor back up. Uh, it took everything for our new windlass to be able to pull ours. Uh, but don't get me wrong, you want to talk about being protected. Now, everything on the right-hand side is a national park. It's a beach. It's gorgeous. You can get there with your dinghy. Um, Georgetown has a couple of places where you can go get food, uh, and it's all dinghy accessible. Uh, this is gorgeous. This is beautiful. There's little restaurants that serve seafood all around here, uh, which are also accessible by dinghy, or you can bring your main boat. Um, Again, from this place, you can definitely make it to uh, Surrey. Uh, you know, from Charlottetown to Surrey is probably around a 12 to 13 hour boat ride, a sailboat ride. That's why you want to stop at Patmere Island. Uh, but again, in Surrey, it, that's another port that sounds like uh, La Bio Renard. Um, Riviera Renal, sorry, at the uh, Gaspé Peninsula. This place has the most boats in PEI for uh, fishing boats and amenities. Now, from here, you can get anything fixed. But not only that, uh, it's an exact or just about the same distance to go from uh, Surrey to the Port of Oxbury or to the Zilla Madeleine. Now, one or the other is about 60 miles, 60 nautical miles. Now, if you pick your day and you pick your winds, uh, during the summertime, you usually get south winds. It'll push you straight for the Zilla Madeleine. And when you come back, you could easily do Ile Madeleine to Sydney, uh, Cape Britain, and then you just come back down the coast, uh, however you like. But you're protected from the waves, and you can enter the Bador Lakes from the north side and come back down to the Port of Oxbury. Uh, or, if the wind changes, you can come back down to Surrey, spend a, day in, uh, spend a night in Surrey at anchor, and then leave there and go to Port of Oxbury. Uh, really, either or is acceptable and more than fun to do. Now, this is going to be a next year's documentary because we still haven't done it yet. So uh, we actually stopped in Panmure Island, and we ended up buying a piece of land because we loved it so much. And uh, that's it. So 
we'll do another one of these presentations next year and uh, show you exactly how we did it. Hey guys, we're off to another adventure. Please like, subscribe, and please share if you like these videos. See you guys. If you guys want to help us without doing much at all, please click like and subscribe. And possibly that little bell to get notifications next time we put out a video. Thanks, guys.